Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining. I'm Siddharth, I'm part of the community team at Avil. Thank you for joining in from various platforms that we're streaming to today. Uh, if you don't know, Favir Avir is a platform which is helping open source projects build sustainable communities that are, of course, helping these projects scale. Mm -hmm. And every week we feature interesting stories about open source projects and folks around it to learn more and more about how things are scaling. And today we have with us another interesting open source project that's disrupting the fintech world. And here's Clem to talk more about it, who's a founder. And he's interestingly also a software mm -hmm. developer who's from Paris, the city of mm -hmm. fashion. But we want to know how from a city of fashion, he became a software developer and ended up having his own YC-backed company, the, which is for, formerly called Numeri and now is called Formance. Hey, mm -hmm. how are you doing? Hey, cool. Yeah, nice to nice to be you. Nice to be here with you today. Yeah, super excited to to have you as a host. Like, uh, excited to be chatted on uh, AVL, which is a really cool platform. Uh, exciting to to see it building. Uh, to see it be being built live. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm in Paris actually. That's true. <laughs> Right. Before we get to other things, uh, I would want to, uh, you know, enclose and disclose to everyone that you have been using these handles, which is called Altitude and 32B6. What's the story behind that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool back story. Like that. That's. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this question, but yeah, that, that's a pretty cool one. Uh, yeah, for sure. So yeah, basically, sorry to be six is one of my handles. Uh, it's actually sorry to be six dot com, which is my uh, personal, just a uh, personal homepage, like in the right. traditional right. old internet fashion way of doing things. You know, you know like uh, black text on a blank screen, uh, and yeah, th this was like uh, just a thought experiment. Like uh, I was getting frustrated with uh com domains uh and uh, actually you know it's super hard to get a dot com domains and at some point i was wondering like how what's the shortest uh possibility that we have so that every human on earth can have his own uh, <laughs> four letters uh dot com domains and you have to use like uh yeah they, this basically what it gives you like if you have four characters uh in hex uh, in hex notation mm -hmm. almost all humans on earth can have a .com. Like this was true before, this is not true now, but uh, this was kind of the story behind 32B6, like uh, <laughs> just being a number on the internet uh, in the shortest possible lens uh, on a .com domain. <laughs> That's nice. We, I'm pretty sure nobody here would have thought of that and how you would also think of, you know, getting a domain that's going to have, be you know, common and generic to everybody who is going to apply to it. That's definitely great. <laughs> While I was doing more research on you, I, I also figured that you're someone who has been interested in 3D models and you are also someone who has been writing code in Clojure. And to be honest, this is the first time that I'm coming across anybody talking to someone who's been writing on Clojure. <laughs> if you want to talk to us a little more about yeah. that and, the, and also the headphones yeah. that you were developing for quite some time. Would you want to talk about that? Yeah, that that that, <laughs> that can be a pretty fun segue. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, first of all, yeah, you there is a real community of closure developers that exist out there. <laughs> Those are real I, people. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, I was kidding. Much, yeah, accordingly, <laughs> there are not much, uh, but still pretty chill community. I do recommend to to the audience here to uh, to yeah just get your hand on closure. It's really fun. Uh, join the communities. People are really nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically, I. Uh, I, I do all of um, uh, I, I do all of many programming languages, but Clojure is like uh, the whole Lisp family is like uh, one that is really relaxing to program in because you're more like uh, mm -hmm. assembling logic uh, and like nesting multiple parts of the program uh, together in a way that is really close to mathematical definition of how data flows in a system, and uh, this is like actually what got me interested into uh, the headphone thing. Like I was uh, basically, I had the idea and, and wanted to try something which was like, a, um, basically the thought experiment was like, hey, hardware is cool, but like, you know, it lives in a complex STL files. You have to run uh, Windows XP to run the latest uh, version of whatever uh, CAD software you want to use. And uh, this really like, uh, this whole thing really lives in a really old tool, uh, as opposed to the whole software tool chain that we have, uh, which mm -hmm. is like, yeah, you're, you're used to CI and all things like that. Uh, and, and that's that's awesome, but hardware is completely different. And I want you to try like to bring uh, the cool things of software to, to building uh, hardware stuff. Uh, and, and doing it in Clojure was a really nice fit because uh, you get to actually transform uh, 
yeah, you basically you you mod, you're modeling space at the speed of thought by uh, basically nesting definition of what is a shape. You know, like if you want a rectangle, you can start from a square and say that you expand it, and you nest these things in closure together, and, and it's just really nice to see. And uh, so yeah, I, I do think like Lisp is a real great fit for modeling. Uh, physical 3D stuff, uh, and, and that was a match in heaven, basically. Um, and I yeah, used Clojure to generate scripts for uh, OpenSCAD, which is a really nice software, uh, open source as well, to um, yeah, to to just uh, do some uh, constructive solid geometry. And um, yeah, I do recommend to the audience to 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 play with OpenCAD and uh, OpenSCAD and uh, and zero zero a library on my GitHub that you can use to actually create some uh, <laughs> some, some stuff in Clojure uh, with OpenSCAD. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, and, and why, uh, so that was pretty cool. And, and then to why the headphone stuff, um, I mean, you, you, you have to, when you want to start this kind of thing, you know, you, you have to find what is the minimum viable thing that you can build, but that is still quite a bit challenging. Obviously, you're not going to build a smartphone like uh, <laughs> Enclosure and OpenSCAD and 3D printing in a week, but hey. you do want to get something out of the door, uh, but complex enough to, to test your tool chain. Uh, and, and the headphones are pretty chill uh, because you basically, it's like good old electronics. You, you just need two wires and, uh, and, uh, and some speakers that, that uh, are very easy to 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 solder uh, and that's very that's something very accessible and uh and yeah that that's basically yeah uh, a, a fun uh experiment uh on that and uh yeah do recommend to the audience to to, to play with that that that's that's a lot of fun but you're going to spend a lot of time doing that <laughs> right uh, rather than the tech being so interesting i also noticed that you had mentioned somewhere that you wanted to ensure that it doesn't cost its weight of gold uh, to make sure that it's yeah. very <laughs> it's easily available yeah. and it's, it's cheaper than what it should have been uh what it is right now yeah. so i'm guessing yeah, that's yeah. when the the entrepreneur in you was uh you know getting started to explore a lot of things and move towards forming a company did you happen to sell those as well the headphones or was it just an experiment that that was an experiment you know like uh you know, the, the kind of relaxing stuff that that you do uh when you when you want to win down but uh but yeah, definitely use that project as a way to, to explore other concepts in open source and, uh, and, and try to, yeah, to, to experiment with ideas around accessibility and things being cheap and free and, uh, and both high quality. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that that's a good challenge for hardware to, uh, you know, just be, um, not, it, it, it's pretty, um, it, it's a shame that you, you know, tie quality with price. Uh, and and uh, I think that's an interesting experiment to try to uh, bring something that is easy to replicate and build at home and that doesn't cost very much and that's still high quality because the quality is built and baked into the software that is enabling the whole thing. Uh, so yeah, that, that's that's one of the concepts uh, that, that, that was explored here. So yeah. <laughs> Right, I can completely relate to that. And when you are the one assembling it, you also have the freedom to, you know, switch and uh, skip those parts that might not work in the future. Exactly. And you're able to customize things as you want. You're not dependent on the manufacturer to send you another one, or you know, you have to go buy exactly. another one. Yeah. Exactly, and that and and that's a that that's a pretty cool concept. Like you know, just uh, uh, trying to find parts that can be easily accessible so that anyone can repair it and anyone can improve it uh, and that you can build a community around the, the, the open hardware that, that you build. So, yeah, there are definitely a lot of concepts uh, in here. And uh, and for the, for the folks that are interested in the audience about that, um, there's um, basically a, a super interesting woman uh, who I think was formerly of Docker. Uh, I think it's Jessie Frazel, but uh, she's... Yeah, uh, there was a company called Kitty Cad, I think. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Kitty Cad, and you, you should check them out. Like they're trying to bring software to Cad uh, as well, and, and I think, um, yeah, just look at their website. You'll instantly understand that there's a pretty cool company. So yeah, I highly recommend that. <laughs> hey, thanks for sharing that. Really insightful. Yeah. So uh, moving on a little bit, uh, we talked about your early days of building these projects and things, but what was it after that before you actually thought of formants? And we'll definitely talk more on that. But what was the time in between? Like, and what were the challenges that actually made you think about Numeri or formants as a company or as a product? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's 
quite a long story actually, but uh, it it starts a, a while ago. Like I, I I have a long history with marketplaces and platforms. Like uh, uh, I think the this is the first thing I shipped uh, as soon as I learned to to code. Like it was a, a website where people could sell clothes and uh, mm -hmm. and that that was pretty fun. Uh, and that was my first experience in building these kind of platforms that that enable. Uh, networks effects and uh, and transactions between people and uh so i after that i also built another platform which was a really cool project which was a um a basically a minecraft thing a related thing it was like uh, uh at the time where minecraft server were still like um, uh can be the, the the best thing in the world you know uh, there, mm -hmm. <laughs> things are a bit changing on that front but uh uh, at the time, uh, it was uh, a lot of indie servers, uh, and people needed uh, actual just needed money to keep the server up and running. So uh, we built a platform where you could sell items on a website. People could pay through Stripe and phone and uh, and actually get the items in their Minecraft server inventory. So that was like the the other platform that I built right after that, and. Uh, and that kind of participates to the to the whole backstory of like uh, how I started to to write software that moves money uh, and do so mm -hmm. reliably, uh, because you mm -hmm. don't want you know in that latest example, uh, the player to uh, lose an item or uh, get it twice or uh, the, this kind of stuff or uh, actually have glitches in in the amounts that they, that they paid for for the item. So uh, the, that was like a. a uh, a first uh, contact, I would say, with uh, writing software that moves money and can go very wrong. Uh, and uh, okay. yeah, basically that led me to actually work for a much more serious company, uh, much more serious marketplace company here in Europe. Uh, so they're pretty big now, doing great. Uh, so yeah, selling vintage furniture uh, with thousands of sellers. Uh, and yeah, they, I had the chance to build the payment engine for that marketplace. So everything from, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, making the money move from the customer to the uh, actual bank account of the seller and yeah, implementing various ways of, um, how many flows in the system and enabling all always better customer experience, like, uh, things that you take for granted today, but like, uh, being able to shop from multiple sellers and do just one payment. This kind of thing like can be incredibly complex to to enable, uh, and that was the starting point of performance. Like uh, while doing so uh, a few years ago, like uh, uh, I yeah, basically there wasn't any tool to to build uh, to weave multiple payments processors together and to build this whole mm -hmm. internal machinery of money movements. Uh, so that that was the inception basically. That's nice. And uh, I'm guessing when you were thinking about this and you were building this, were you alone uh, in this journey or did you have company? Did you have other people who were also sharing the same views and wanted to build this with you? Uh, so when I was still at the marketplace, like I uh, started alone, but I uh, started as the sole developer on the payment stuff. But eventually we built a real team uh, working on payments with people. Uh, from mm -hmm. the financial uh, team and people from the product team as well and people from the operations team. So this was like a really solid, uh, basically, yeah, payments team at the marketplace. So I was not around that then. And yeah, uh, I actually wanted to go further on that. Like, you know, this wasn't just acceptable to not have any tool to build this uh, kind of stuff. Uh, and so I wanted to transform that into a product and started to iterate on my end. Like, you know, these... Uh, something that developers tend to do, like you start to build stuff uh, and, and you think that uh, the code is the, the the whole thing, you know? And uh, so I actually started the company with that <laughs> and eventually okay. quickly realized that it's pretty cool to have a team as well to work easy on things that are be beyond the code and, and actually turn, turn the product into a real company. I got it. So after that, I believe when you started building this, you initially named it Numeri and then you decided to change it to Formance. Why was that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that was uh, a few months ago. But uh, yeah, there, there are probably some advices for new folks here and uh, and founders. Like uh, there, there are many ways to to name your company, uh, but there are uh, things that you want to optimize for and things that you want to to avoid uh, to the extent that's possible. And uh, if you go to the, like, uh, go to Crunchbase or uh, go to the YC top companies and uh, just check out the name and uh, and get yourself an idea of, like, uh, 
how, how those names are constructed and, uh, and what's the, the story behind them. And you'll see that like there is no real correlation between like, um, um, I, I would say uh, it's not really quality, but quality of the name and the success of the company. Like uh, the, the the correlation is pretty low, but there. Mm -hmm. So that's that that's something. It's pretty important to have a good name, but that's not gonna. You can totally be a unicorn and and have a pretty bad name actually. Like uh, Google, even is it, it's a pretty terrible name actually. Like you, it's pretty hard to write, and uh, now everybody knows it. But uh, it's <laughs> I'm not sure this was a good name in the first place. But this didn't prevent them from. Uh, being a top company today. And, uh, but there are things you want to avoid. And basically, things that uh, you want to avoid is like uh, things that will make you uh, lose time and things that will slow you down. And things that can really slow you down is like the uh, trademark conflicts and things like that on your, the name that you choose. So this is why um, I advise like new founders to avoid like super uh, obvious names that will 100% lead into them being in court like uh, in a few months uh, over uh, a competitor wanting to use a similar name. So yeah, and uh, this is the kind of thing like uh, that, that was uh, that happened to be a problem with Nuri. Like uh, uh, eventually, if you go to Crunchbase, you can see that there are more than uh, 500 companies starting with them. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that you want to avoid basically. <laughs> I'm glad you, you shared that because that's something that's not being that that definitely doesn't being a, isn't a topic that is being talked about a lot and people don't really give a lot of importance on naming that probably all of us are sticking towards uh, fancy names but we don't really give that a thought that you might end up in the court like you mentioned a week from now <laughs> or a month from now right yeah. thank you so exactly. much for sharing and you want to, exactly and you want to optimize for ownability as well like it's super hard to optimize for you ownability when there are three companies called the same name like it's uh it's super complex to like well to to own your name and and, and mm -hmm. what you really want to have is like when people type your name in google you're not buried into a thousand searches uh basically you come out on top because the name is unique enough uh right. to 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 to, to get on the top easily. So that's, uh, that's also super important in the beginning for people to find you easily. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's super complex. And uh, you also want that, that's kind of a, a PG advice from Moisey, but uh, if you don't own the .com of your name, that's probably going to lead to some trouble in the end. So you should consider changing your name because that's, uh, so that's, uh, I think this is less true today because you have other TLDs that are uh, taking off like X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. I think I O was all the rage like a few years ago, but it's starting to feel like uh, uh, the good old uh, to 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 uh, to K eleven years. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically X, Y, Z. Uh, kind of afraid that it will lead to the same thing. Uh, and dot com is like can it be? Yeah, the, the golden standard of names. So um, this is something you, you want to consider as well. Like if you have like get xyz.com, you don't really own XYZ. Like yeah, the, you're always at risk of a competitor uh, doing the same thing, going on the same domain with the .com and that's going to be pretty terrible for you. That's true uh, because there's always a fight to get that .com domain because in the SEO sense yeah. as well, that's what is going to show up on exactly. the top and you yeah. always want to have that and not depend on any of the other people to claim yeah. that before you do. Yeah. That's true. And it's crazy because uh, you, 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 uh, 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy because you think that people go into website by searching the name and Google and things like that. But there are a lot of people that just type .com when they want to access a service. And uh, I actually mm -hmm. heard a lot of stories from my batch and also from those about uh, just people mixing up them with uh, another company just because they didn't have the dot com, uh, and that's quite terrible. Like, uh, yeah, you, 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 to the extent that's possible, this is probably something you want to avoid and try to own the dot com. Yeah. That's very true. And uh, now yeah. that we're talking a little bit about the project as well, the first thing that somebody comes across when they're trying out your project is the hello world of your project, right? And I noticed it also yeah. has an interesting angle to it, uh, a reference from a show from NBC and the game called Coins of Dunshire that you have tried to implement <laughs> there as well. Are you the one who's, yeah. uh, who's come up with that idea? Are you someone who watches a lot of seasons and series? Or was it somewhere else in the team? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, the, this one is actually not me. Uh, it's uh, one of the guys on the team who's working on the documentation uh, and their preservations from. So he, he had the parts and celebration reference, uh, and uh, that that's, that that was pretty cool, and it's working well, especially with the 
cons of Dunshire because there is this whole like uh, yeah you can work watch the watch this uh, on YouTube but there is this whole uh, game with the guy who has a Lederman hat and, uh, and it works very well uh, for us as a reference and there are other reference that I do love. Uh, uh, movies that I do love uh, on the docs as well. Like uh, there's uh, some reference around a movie called Office Space. I don't know if mm. you uh, seen that movie, but like it's a uh, pretty golden standard today. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> this one's pretty fun and can lead to to super cool references. We're trying to continuously hide references everywhere, so you may find some other ones, but but I obviously won't tell uh, all the reference that you have here. So yeah, you, you're going to have to find it, to find them on your own. Yeah. <laughs> and there's definitely going to be motivation for everybody here to check it out. And I mean, kudos to your team <laughs> for doing that because it, it actually makes it a lot more interesting to read it. I, I was going through all of this. Uh, I, I think after the time we met for the first time, we were having a chat and it was really interesting and very well written. The, the documentation was so congratulations on that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, I, I mean, this is a, um, yeah, when you're building an open source product, like uh, the, 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 the documentation is almost the product, you know, like it, it, it's so, uh, you just can't have people to just not grasp everything uh, at first glance. And uh, mm -hmm. you want people to be able to self onboard themselves on the product. So yeah, it is as important as the product, maybe even more important actually, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And uh, since I think this is probably the first time that we're featuring a FinType project here, there are some terms that I'm sure mm -hmm. the folks would need to know before they actually get deep into the technical side mm -hmm. of it or using it for yep. their own project, right? Can you maybe try yep. and highlight some of those terms mm -hmm. that people would need to know? Yeah, uh, I would say probably Ledger is probably the, <laughs> the most obvious one that, that you want to, uh, to wrap your hand uh, around. Uh, so that that's uh, for new for folks new to fintech here, like a ledger is like the the it's a, uh, it's actually a very old uh, concept. Like uh, I think mm -hmm. it there uh, it, it goes back to the 16th century uh, or even older. Uh, but uh, that's just the concept of like keeping track of every transaction uh, in a way that is immutable uh, and in a way that we call uh, double entry, basically, so that you can get a perfect. Uh, audit trail of what uh, your company's finances are uh, and what and how money moves throughout your company and what your company uh, uh, owes to what kind of people and accounts. So this, yeah, big book of transaction. Uh, so sometimes when the people hear, hear about Ledger, you, you know, they, they think about the, the, uh, the, the crypto way to, to store your asset. Like there's a company called Ledger that does a, uh, uh, a cold wallet that is really cool. Uh, so the, that is uh, that is not what we mean here by ledger. It's really a database of financial transactions, mm -hmm. and uh, there uh, because that concept is super old. Like there is many ways uh, and many um, incarnations of ledgers today. Uh, so basically, these where things start to get interesting uh, and how. Performance is different from QuickBooks and other tools, so we, we can probably dive into that at some point. But uh, yeah, that, that's uh, that's probably one of the terms that, that you want to know. Uh, uh, yeah, probably the most important here. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Now that we have started talking about that, would you do you think this is the right time to maybe uh, talk about a specific use case and you know kind of demo the project so it makes more sense to everyone? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we, we can definitely do that. But uh, basically, our users today are using Formans to build, uh, let's say, three types of uh, products. So mostly mm -hmm. fintech companies, platforms companies, and marketplaces. Um, all of them are a bit different, uh, but uh, the, the common denominator between all of them is that they're all having very creative and unique ways of uh, moving money in their system. So if mm -hmm. you're a marketplace, you're going to have like customers uh, that are going to an e-commerce website to buy some stuff and then eventually a merchant is going to get paid. Your marketplace is probably a solid way for the merchants to uh, sell on the internet because you handle everything for him, like sometimes the delivery, sometimes the marketing, like you, you do provide a lot of value to the merchant, which is why he's using the marketplace. And the more value you provide, the more custom your money uh, flow is for your marketplace. Uh, and yeah, that, that's where I, basically one of the use cases of performance. And then we also work with platforms and fintechs. And then it's a lot of subcategories of different types of products. But uh, yeah, fintechs is the fintech companies are definitely growing today. You have so many 
local version of like new innovation uh, that bring good financial product to people like investment products in a way that is easy to consume these are the kind mm -hmm. of companies we're working with and they use the ledger in a way that yeah it is probably the most critical part of the system where they keep track of yeah user balances and way uh, and transactions that happen uh, in the system uh, so uh, yeah multiple use cases uh, kind of similar to stripe you know you can use stripe uh, whatever kind of merchant that you are, you can use formants to the extent that your money flows are a bit complex. Uh, and yeah, this, uh, this is what you can do. So yeah, yeah we, we can definitely uh, spend a bit of time uh, in a code editor uh, doing live coding, yeah. you know, <laughs> this kind yeah. of stuff that, that is always uh, pretty fun to do. Um, yeah, all right. right. While you're getting um, that up, just one other question here. Um, this is this is very uh, well written on your website as well that you're not a competitor to Stripe, but you go hand in hand with Stripe yeah. because you need something that's going to handle payments and you're someone who went, uh, maintains the ledger, right? Are there other yeah. parts of what you also need to make sure, let's say I'm, I'm building a, um, a an application that's that has to handle a lot of finances in it. Uh, other yeah. than the front end and the back end that I'm going to develop, are there other pieces also that I need to fix to this to make this a full-fledged uh, an application yeah, that can totally. handle all of things. Yeah, yeah totally. There is definitely a product that you that you can embed and and that we can help you weave together. But uh, typically, um, it's going to depend on the app that you want to build. But uh, the, the the more sophisticated it gets, the more likely it is that you'll go beyond just uh, payments and that you'll need other products like. Maybe you're going to offer uh, some uh, plastic cards to your user, like debit and credit cards to your user. For that, you may mm -hmm. want to use another product. Uh, you may have some complex transfer uh, in different geographies, so you're going to strive for some of them, but you're going to use also other providers to handle, uh, let's say, user deposits uh, in other geographies uh, where you know that uh, some processors are doing great work. Um, there is also a lot of interesting stuff about instant payments and instant transfers. Uh, so basically, in Europe, we are getting new new uh, new widgets to basically send money in a few seconds uh, between different banks. Uh, the same thing in, uh, mm -hmm. is happening in the US with Fed now, and uh, you have RTP as well in the UK. And all around the world, there, there is this trend and shift towards real-time payments, but that requires like to, uh, more often than not to, for you to assemble more tools and strategy to, to, to actually perform that. So yeah, there, there's mm -hmm. definitely a broad ecosystem that you can use. And then there's a whole like, uh, uh maybe we can uh define that for for people in the audience as well but there's this, this whole trend around um uh, basically bringing financial products directly uh into other products uh, which is what we call uh embedded finance so you your app is also probably at some point if you grow and doing well you may want to add like some loans uh capabilities to your app and you have like a lot of providers mm -hmm. that can help you with that uh, and then you have a lot of things to decide to uh, to uh, to decide around who is in the right in the loans and things like that. But yeah, so to 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 cut it short, yeah, there's definitely a broad ecosystem of companies that you can weave uh, together to build your new fintech or uh, new products that, that that has fintech components to it. Uh, but yeah, and one of them uh, is the ledger that we have at Formans actually. So this is why I'm sharing my screen. And uh, yeah, we. We can uh, just get a quick overview of uh, what it's like to, to use the ledger from a, a TypeScript backend. But uh, what you get here, uh, let me see if everything works. Uh, yeah, so we have a simple script uh, where we actually import uh, the ledger SDK uh, of Romans. And then we actually start to use a ledger uh, that we call demo uh, 1001 here. And then uh, we have a bunch of stuff that we can do on the ledger, but that may require to, to uh, just do, let's do a simple transaction on the ledger and we can take it from here. Uh, so we are gonna create a ledger transaction that moves money uh, in our system. So uh, let's view this just now. So a ledger transaction is like, just view it as a line that describes uh, how much of what assets move uh, from where to where. And those are very abstract concepts, but you can uh, basically describe what is where uh, as different accounts in the system. And those accounts can represent anything, you know, so you can have 
a ledger where your user have a certain balance with you because you're, let's say, an investing app. So your user are going to have like a, uh, an account that's going to have a balance in USD and then a balance in some uh, kind of shares, maybe some uh, stocks that can trade on uh, that trade on the New York Stock Exchange or uh, crypto assets that, that you uh, hold uh, onto your own account. So you're going to have different accounts and this is what we're going to do here. So let's, uh, let's create a simple transaction first and say that the source of the transaction, so where the money is coming from we we say money but uh, we 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 can go more abstract and say just assets so where the money is coming from and where it's going to so let's uh you know it's funny i i have a copilot enable here and it's scaring me because it's getting so good and it's more often than not actually writing the whole code for me so that <laughs> that that that's working fairly well uh but let's say we move a single uh a single dollar from an account that we call World to an account that we call Alice. Uh, so let's do just that. And I'm going to use. Um, we're going to come to the to that a bit later. But I'm going to use this um, this uh, this annotation for assets uh, and for USD. So let's uh, just do that. So all right, yarn. Okay, uh, TS and index. Right, and obviously, uh, when you're live coding stuff, usually this doesn't go as well. <laughs> and uh, this uh, this is actually I probably messed up somewhere, um, and I'm gonna fix that right away. Uh, and define income. All right, let me just take back. Okay, this is working well. Let me just try another thing. Okay, all right, ledger. It's, it's, it's terrible because I do love life coding, but it's such a dangerous thing to do that uh, you <laughs> you want to be sure uh, that, that you get your things right when you do it. Okay, let's uh, let's move back a few things here. Uh, import. I'm going to need some support for the, from the chat, guys. This is a stressful moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, import the library. Get ledger. Uh, okay. So just to give some context about what we're doing here. Um, so the we're basically requiring the, the SDK that is going to talk to the ledger. And the ledger has like a, this um, really simple HTTP REST API where you can commit transaction and read transaction, get the list of accounts and get the balances of accounts. And this is what we are using here. So we are connecting to a local uh, ledger. Uh, so let's do just that. Cluster gets ledger. All right. Um, okay, let's, let's just try another name. Okay, ledger gets that. Oh, we're going to fail again, but uh, your TS new. All right, that, that kind of works. I may have messed up with the imports uh, just before the, the call, but yeah, that, that's that's pretty cool. We are back in track. Um, and then you, so we just uh, committed a transaction here, so this one, and then we are going to see if there are transaction uh, in the ledger. So ledger, yeah, gets transaction. All right. Okay, let's just store that. Okay, and then display it. Okay. Okay, okay so um, a bunch of things here. Uh, so you, we just call the API, we get the transaction. There is uh, a cursor system, uh, a cursor-based pagination. Uh, cursor-based pagination is great. You can have very large data sets and we do have very large data sets of transaction uh, when people use deformance ledger. So this is why we have this kind of cursor-based pagination. I do encourage like uh, people in the audience to to check how to implement that. That is a pretty easy concept, but still can make your app way more performance uh, than uh, with uh, other ways of uh, handling pagination in in, uh, in SQL. Uh, so we have our transaction, and uh, so basically we can now try to do something more interesting, which is going to be 
uh, getting the account on the ledger and see what was the impact of that transaction on the uh, ledger account. So let's say ledger uh, get account. Okay, so let's, um, Alice ledger await ledger get account. Alice. And let's see uh, what is the, the balance for the Alice account. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's just get that. All right. So we can see that Alice has $1. Uh, and when I say $1, it's because uh, actually uh, we say we type USD slash two here. So there's a page in our documentation that you can check, which explains it this rational, but because people that use our ledger use it in a way where they use it between Stripe and other payment provider and sometimes other fintech services providers, there's a, there's a preference stuff that actually leads to preference stories uh, in, in fintech, which is like uh, payment services provider do love to use uh, different ways to represent numbers and to represent uh, the meaning of what a USD is. So you may have sometimes if you go to Stripe, a USD, if you want to move a USD, you have to move a hundred uh, of what they call USD because they are talking in cents. And that is kind of the best practice uh, that is widely accepted in FinTech. And some other payments uh, providers do, let's say they are a bit more creative and they want to <laughs> do some pretty, uh, uh, they, 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 they want to go the, the, the creative route, you know, and they sometimes will let you write like one USD and accept it as like uh, an, un an entire USD instead of cents. And sometimes it lets you use floats and sometimes it lets you use integers, which leads to um, one of the most like classical problems that you can see in homegrown systems, which is like, uh, you want to move a dollar, you want to send a dollar to that merchant. And instead of that, you actually send a hundred times uh, that dollar to the merchant, which leads to pretty uh, big catastrophes. So yeah, <laughs> this, this is why uh, we uh, kind of recommend people to use this way of uh, describing uh, USD and assets in their system, which is like uh, a way to, to say that you take a USD and you actually multiply it by uh, 10 to the, neg to the negative power of two. So that, that gives you a, a Z denomination in sense. So uh, this is what we have here. And maybe I can show you like how does that works uh, in the UI. That that's that's gonna be quite interesting to see as well. Uh, all right, cool. I'm gonna share another screen. Okay, uh, stop sharing. Okay, window. Okay, um, can you see a UI that that shows the uh, two accounts in one transaction? Yes, we can. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Yeah, so this is basically the, the UI. I'm going to zoom for the audience, but uh, this is basically the UI that you get with the ledger and that uh, basically lets you see the, the, the entire transactions that you have in the accounts. So here we have our transaction where we send money to Alice from the world account. Uh, so the balance of Alice is this and the balance of the world account gets to, to this. And uh, so that is like uh, everything you need to understand to understand the basics of ledger. So if you uh, get that, Congratulations, you can build very simple, super complex financial products, so <laughs> accounts and transactions. And uh, you basically use that in a way uh, that you combine these blocks to create uh, the very specific story of, of your system. So if you're a marketplace, you're going to have accounts that are way more complex than that. And if you use, uh, if you're a fintech, you're going to have accounts that start with user, deposits, transfers, uh, and going to have this whole hierarchy of accounts that that lets you model how money exists in your system uh, in real time. And um, one thing to note as well uh, for people in the audience is like, this is your book. Uh, like if you use Stripe and use Formance or uh, let, or even uh, a ledger that you built yourself, uh, you the money still sits physically on Stripe's bank accounts, uh, but you do represent it on the ledger. And that the purpose of doing that is because uh, you may have a thousand dollars on Stripe, but uh, you this thousand dollar is going to end up in a lot of different pockets. Like it's going to end up in your uh, your merchant pockets. It's going to end up uh, on your own account for your commission uh, or the fee that you collected. And before you start to go back to doing transfers to some people, you need to actually figure out uh, w what is the actual amounts that that you want to to send. So this is why. You can use the ledger to do that. And maybe I can show last uh, example uh, uh, on the ledger, but uh, how to do 
how to do it with a script uh, that, that lets you do some complex transactions. Uh, I can reshare the VS Code uh, window. So yeah, what we have uh, in the forms ledger, so you can either submit a simple transaction like this one. So in cases where you know what you want to commit uh, in the ledger, so like here, this transaction was pretty simple. So there is no real computation going on. But uh, there's another like common way of fucking up your fintech application is like getting the math wrong about how to uh, compute monetary amounts. And uh, basically this is something that, we, that we've taken care of in the NumScript system that we have. So let's say uh, that we're going to have um, a use case is, let's take a very concrete example. Uh, you know, a typical use case is that you see is like, sometimes you are at checkout and you may have a wallet on that website or app uh, where you have some credit for the, uh, from the system. Like you're ordering some food and you're going to pay like $10 by card, but you still have like $3 hanging out in your wallet. So you're going to be uh, having a transaction in the ledger where the money is coming from two different places, both your wallet and your, uh, and, and the, and the, basically your credit card for the payment. So this is something that's very easy to, to do in NumScript. So let's say we're going to create, um, a script that we are going to call pay.num. So num is like NumScript is the, uh, DSL that we created for the performance ledger so that it's, uh, it's a scripting system that lets you model these transactions. So they are going to. Once a NAMP script executes, it's going to lead to a transaction that looks very close to, to that, but it's going to be computed by NAMP script. So let's start with the example that, that I had in mind. So we're looking for, let's say, 13 USD. So I'm using again the USD2 notation here. And we're using uh, reds. We are going to create uh, a multi source transaction uh, here. And then uh, let's just move it to a payment account on the ledger. So, um, yeah, we, we are going to pull money from two sources. I'm using our hard coded values here, of course, for the sake of the demo, but you can use variables as well. Uh, let's say we are going to try to pull money from the user wallet, uh, in the first place, because yeah, the user may still have some credit with us. And the, and the last, um, and in the last account that we're going to try to use as a source, Let's say, okay, if the user doesn't have any money or enough money on its wallet, uh, let's call it wallet, uh, we are going to actually just pull money from a world account that represents the outside world, and in that case, our payment. So that's something, uh, that's a script that you can write, and we have like the VS Code extension for you to, to, to be able to write it easily. Uh, and then you can execute that script against the ledger, again, using the SDK. So in that case, you're going to do a ledger dot execute and then we are going to pass uh, the uh, actual content uh, of the script here so this is going to be a quick not gs tutorials to two folks out there as well uh, but let's import pass from pass uh, and import uh, let me add the type uh, types node all right um, Okay, let's execute the script. Let's create a quick script function. All right, uh, return. Uh, let's just code the happy pass for the sake of the demo, but uh, I read, I think, and we are gonna assume that this script is gonna be here. Uh, all right, and then we are going to use pay.num, right, okay scripts, and then we are going to use that. Uh, a name, K. And um, yeah, this is kind of a boilerplate function that, that's pretty easy to write. Uh, and then we can actually execute that and pray the life coding gods that this transaction went through. Okay. Okay, cool. So uh, basically, if we check the uh, transaction again on the ledger, we are going to see that we have new transaction committed from uh, what I just did. Uh, okay, you should be seeing the, the UI again. But yeah, basically here, money moved from the world account directly uh, because the user didn't have any money. But should the user wallet was created with some uh, money in the first place, 
you would have had a neat way to actually avoid making complex computation about like how much money do I take from the wallet and how much money do I take from the payment and this whole handle here uh, and this uh, basically avoids you to um, avoids you to to uh, to to be at risk of making some computation mistakes and monetary amounts and you can do many more things with NumScript I'm not gonna demo everything because yeah the clock is uh, kind of moving forward here but uh, you can uh, um, exactly like we have multiple sources here, you can say that you want 15% of that money to go to a taxes account and then uh, the remaining of that money to uh, yourself as platform, for example. And uh, this is this will be basically all handled for you. And, uh, and um, yeah, I'm going to, okay, sure. Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this is basically what it looks like. So you can um, have as many sources and destinations as you want and all the computation that's going to be, are going to be handled for you. So this will uh, definitely save you, uh, prevent a lot of mistakes that, that can happen in uh, homegrown systems. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what we typically recommend folks to do when they start to use formants, uh, if they have a lot of computation going on. Use NumScript is going to be easier. The, the math is correct. You can check out the virtual machine that runs that. Uh, it, it's basically um, the idea of taking care of the uh, hardest problem as the, at the lowest possible level. And in that case, it's in the virtual machine that we created for, for the ledger. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for oh. that. Deb. I have a question yeah. in mind while we're looking at this. Um, so it's pretty obvious that all the fiat currencies are already covered with uh, what you're trying to build because you showed us a demo with UST, right? Uh, things are yeah. also moving to the crypto world fast enough. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Stripe also uh, supports cryptocurrencies as of now. So if, if somebody yeah. wants to maintain a ledger, which is surrounding yeah. cryptocurrencies at this point with formants, is that available right out of box or do they need to make some changes to do that? Yeah, it's definitely available right of the box. Like we don't, uh, the cool thing about performance ledger is like we don't make any assumption about like the exact uh, thing that you're going to move around in your ledger. So you can use USD, mm -hmm. but you can also use any type of assets. Like we have folks that use the ledger for uh, to keep track of BTCs or other crypto assets, uh, sometimes DeFi assets as well. So in that case, the assets name that you use is typically like a kind of code that identifies that, that asset uniquely in your system. And yeah, this is uh, basically just, a, just a, a, denom a denomination of what you're trying to move. The only thing that we ask you and that we need you to do is to, uh, um, we, we, we need you to move decimals, uh, decimal types of assets. Like we don't do non-decimal system. You can do it actually, but it's a way more complex. And for the folks interested in the audience, like you can, uh, you can go to pound US, you can go to Wikipedia or like uh, look out for pound USD. This was a pretty, pretty interesting stuff where uh, like uh, when the uh, sterling pounds were, was not living in a decimal world uh, and, and there's a lot of like interesting uh, money literature for uh, money nerds out there about like uh, non-decimal monetary systems and uh, and you have like uh, basically that happening uh, with pound USD. Uh, that's the case in Harry Potter as well where we have like this super complex way of converting assets uh, and that's that's something you can build on formats, but it's going to be uh, way harder than uh, using decimal system. So, uh, yeah, but you can move anything. Basically. <laughs> hey, with all of these extra insights coming out of the picture, I'm sure the audience is loving their time here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I also remember, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, why we were talking for the first time, you were mentioning that uh, while this project was still in the idea phase, you were fortunate enough to get it, uh, get it backed by Y Combinator, right? And we also have a question relating to that here on the question and answer section. Um, somebody's asking you, how does it feel to be part of the YC uh, YC ecosystem and getting these awesome mentors for you? And I would also <laughs> want to add a little bit to that question and ask you, what was that like? Uh, I, I'm not a pretty sure if a lot of projects make it into it on the design phase or the idea phase of it. But what was it like? What was the process like for everybody listening to us? Yeah, yeah. That feels like... Um... That feels like a lot of work. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a really intense journey. I, I do uh, advise. Like, yeah, that's that's really awesome and intense journey. Uh, and it's really 
awesome to have like uh, such amazing uh, advisors from the start. Like uh, Y Combinator is very good in many things. Uh, one of the things they're consist consistently good at is like telling you what is not working and what you're trying to do. And then typically what happens is like you do it anyway and then you come back uh, a few days later and tell them, yeah, you were right in the first place. Like <laughs> This is basically <laughs> uh, a common theme for YC funders. Like, uh, doing a bunch of mistakes that they told you uh, not to do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so this is one of the things YC is very good at. It's like moving you back to the uh, actual things that matter. Like when you join YC, you get this mug where, uh, where it's written on the mug, like just something like that. Uh, make some, build something people want. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I mean, that, that's the whole thing. Like uh, they, they, they try to keep you on track on that, on that ID for as long as possible and to use that leverage time of the batch to make sure that uh, you're really avoiding any distraction. Uh, and that is something that uh, new founders like can, uh, should really be aware of. Like you um, get back to the core of it, like uh, talk to users, uh, write some code. And if you do that, uh, you'll do great. And that's, uh, that's the different thing about all this. Like you, you have to go to a fancy accelerator. Uh, there is uh, the, the, the world class thing to be told super basic advice that happens to be the truth. You know, that, that's, uh, that's what's really cool about it. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, uh, the, yeah, the, the, that, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of pretty cool. Uh, and obviously like the folks as well, as well is probably the, the the most interesting thing about YC, like you get to ha experience such an uh, amount of energy from other founders uh, during the batch. And then afterwards that uh, really makes it worse. Uh, it's found like, uh, it's yeah, that, that's the whole community around it is like definitely the top of set of YC probably. Mm. Right, and these days there's a lot of open source projects as well who are making it into YC and coming out in a bigger scale while yeah. they're graduating from YC. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Wesh is definitely uh, banging a lot, of, uh, banging a lot on open source right now, uh, and I feel like there, there's a whole like trend of like uh, having either new OS product or uh, OSS version of commercial product. Like uh, there's a, uh, mm -hmm. there's this uh, whole uh, kind of essays around uh, commercial or uh, commercial OSS that you can read about. That is super interesting, and basically, yeah, the, the trend now is to have like a um, I think there was like a few days ago on Hack News uh, an interesting post about like how long does it take to have like the OSS version uh, of another company that uh, was working uh, before, and uh, and this time uh, and this time frame is getting shorter every day, and uh, this leads to a very interesting, interesting class of product that uh, uh, take the the initial value prop and make it uh, very more. Uh, accessible, composable, uh, and all the other qualities of open source that, that we know. So yeah, the super need of YC to, to fund those OSS companies for sure. Right, and we are fortunate to be in this time where the, the time delay between something proprietary and I mean, uh, open source alternative to something proprietary is being built because that gives you a lot of freedom to choose what you want modify it as you wish and yeah. you're not dependent on for just to pay folks and you don't really know what's happening in the background here you have complete transparency and i believe yeah. that's the best way to be yeah exactly yeah so, yeah transparency and and, and uh that's definitely a, a good asset as well for uh, a whole class of products that can uh, where transparency is like kind of the uh top feature that this product could have and uh when you have like the proprietary version of that product uh basically it completely avoids, uh, completely lacks this uh, quality of transparency because of the proprietary nature of that. And uh, having the OSS version sometimes unlocks some distribution of that product as well, because that was uh, a key ask for some people that, that wanted to do this kind of tool. So um, yeah, this, this is super uh, interesting for sure. Right. I'm actually coming down to the last few questions that I have for you today. So I'm going to switch on this feature that we have on the platform, which is called Get On Stage. So anybody in the audience, if they would want to come join us here and talk to us directly, they could come along. <laughs> or if you'd want to maybe drop your questions on the Q&A section, I have my eyes there. Please feel free to do that. So the other question now uh, that I have in mind while we're talking about the open source way of doing things is, uh, how do you think is it is it working out for you building an open building as a public project building it in, uh, as an open source project? How do you think is it working for you? How supportive do you think uh, the community has been for 
are not so very explored uh, i would say it's not a very explored domain uh, yeah. let's put it like that yeah. how do you think the community has been reacting to that yeah yeah for sure yeah definitely uh the, this is interesting like you for us like there, there was multiple drivers that that enable that that make um open source a, a non brainer for us like uh basically it comes back to to the transparency that that you mentioned of like and also key aspects around mission criticality of the product that we're building that requires a lot of uh exposure and that naturally lives well as an open source product. The community thing is really interesting as well. Like you, you um, basically there are tons of interesting reads about that. Like you, um, there is a book in the Stripe Press library that you can check out, which is called uh, Building in Public. Uh, and, and this gives you a lot of interesting insights around OSS communities, which happen to be super hard to get in a stage where you have uh, contributors that actually uh, contribute to the actual building on the pro of the product uh, as opposed to things around it. And this is the route that we've chosen from the start. Like, uh, it, it's pretty complex to get people to contribute to a crit mission critical ledger, but we do get people that contribute on things around the product, like things like SDKs or the connectors to payment providers that we're building. Even packaging, like yesterday, some uh, a guy was uh, building the, the packaging of the ledger for Mix OS, which is a pretty cool uh, OS as well. And this is what you want to try to enable the most as an open source product, like uh, because these kind of contribution are almost self-contained. Like it will take you a few hours to create a new packaging for an open source product, and you can drive it from start to finish as a, an external contributor and it doesn't require you to know the super complex internal of the product and the company. So that's that's what, what I've been working for us is like things on top of the product and we are super glad and, uh, and I want to thank the the folks that, that contributed to, to, to the SDKs and testings and documentation and packaging for, for that. Uh, so that, that is really what we wanted to, to enable uh, and uh, and something that people start to do, so that, that we are super happy with that. And uh, we also start to get people reviewing our uh, own pull requests on our ledger. So that's that's something interesting as well. Uh, it's it's a pretty cool feeling, you know, when you're used to develop as a team, and then all of a sudden there's like a uh, a guy from nowhere who's like commenting your PR and you're like, oh, this, this, this is actually pretty cool. And uh, and actually he's right. I should change that. <laughs> that's uh, that's another thing that, that you can, uh, um, that you can try to leverage your contributor for like uh, reviewing on top of the other things around the product that, that kind of works well. Mm -hmm. That's true. All of a sudden you don't realize when your team becomes bigger than you would have expected it to be at any point. And there are people coming in yeah. and contributing selflessly. And that's, that's an amazing thing that open source brings. Yeah, yeah. Anything uh, specific that you would want to highlight here where uh, folks could jump in and contribute and maybe mention a couple of things that's coming in at the roadmap. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, uh, what we, uh, it's actually, I'm going to, to, to go back to the, uh, things on top that I mentioned. So anything around packaging, testing, reporting, uh, documentation and testing that that is super valuable because this is something that we can have you merge uh that that can that we can get merged pretty easily so that we you can actually be part of that community uh, uh in a few hours so uh especially um testing for testing and creating sdks for languages that uh, we are don't uh own internally so that we had a contribution for the rest sdk that that is something with, that we do love uh, a lot uh, because it makes the product way easier to use. Uh, if some people would want to create like some, uh, uh, let's say Laravel or Rails or Django for, um, SDKs for on top of the SDKs for the languages that we have, that would be fantastic. Uh, and we are super open to that. Uh, so uh, yeah, this kind of uh, packaging on, on top is super helpful for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure folks would be really excited to come on board and start contributing right sure. away. Uh, that, uh, that brings me to the last question that I have for today. And I'm, I'm also looking at the question and answer here. Any concluding thoughts that you would want to share? I'm pretty sure the folks watching here and who are going to watch us after the, the recording is up. There'll be a lot of folks who are following the same path, probably also really looking forward to, you know, get backed by YC. Any, any, any notes that you would want to share with them? Any learnings from your journey? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh... It's gonna, um, it's gonna 
go back to the uh, stupidest advice I can give, but that really works. Uh, talk to users, folks, uh, especially as this uh, developer community. Uh, I know like the idle thing for a, for a developer or hacker is like to, you know, build this thing in a vacuum and have somehow people use it and then make money for some reason. Uh, and that that's the probably the, the, the common goal and dream of many uh, developers out there. But um, that's something that probably can work if you're uh, creating Bitcoin or something very experimental like that. But uh, you get so much shots at winning uh, by just talking a lot to people, like uh, try to book your calendar with user talks. That, that is probably the uh, thing that will help you get into IC more than anything. Like if you know your market, you know your users, uh, and you get into a place where you can iterate fast on your product, uh, this is probably key, like uh, the, the, the best proxy for success uh, and ability to, to get into IC is uh, ability to keep the pace, know your market, uh, move fast. Uh, and, and from that, you're, there's probably nothing that will prevent you from uh, getting into IC and then uh, getting into the top companies of IC. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I had so much fun talking to you today. Hello. I can't really put it into words of how much fun I've had today talking to you. And thank you so much for taking out time from your busy okay. schedule. Also, thank you everybody in the audience for staying here and being such such great an audience.